good afternoon doctors on behalf of hydro healthcare i dr prashant welcome you to this webinar on troubleshooting pcos doctors as you know at hydro we market multiple products in multiple therapy areas like in gynecology dermatology orthopedics pulmonology etc we have a very strong r&d support and we have developed many unique formulations keeping patient benefit in mind our endeavor is to develop products formulation and combination which will finally improve patient compliance and ultimately clinical outcome we have developed insert patches reverse treatment patches for better patient compliance at friends our division gynecology obstetrics and ivf is an important therapy segment for us we market products for vaginal health like feminora pellitra we have formulated and introduced vaginal film containing lactic acid in oral formulations besides didropal and other products we market mylotin Mylotin is a unique nutraceutical for PCOS management, containing myoinositol and dicyanositol in the ratio of 40 to 1, chromium picolinate and melatonin along with folic acid and vitamin D. To speak more about PCOS management with nutraceuticals, we have Dr. Shashibala with us today. Welcome, Dr. Shashibala. Welcome, madam. Thank you. Dr. So Dr. Shashibala much. is MBBS DGO from Patna. She has done her DNB from Mumbai, Sion Hospital. Madam is alumni of CMAST Mumbai, has done observership gynec oncology in TMH Mumbai. Madam has done master's in diploma and master's and diploma in cosmetic gynecology from ICCG, advanced diploma in ART and reproductive medicine from Germany. Madam is director and chief fertility consultant at Evita IVF Patna, expert gynec endoscopic surgeon, and has received FMF UK license for NT scan. Most importantly for us, Madam has got first rank in all India DNB exam. Wonderful, Madam. We know how difficult it is. Sure. Member of Executive Committee, IFS Zarkand Chapter, Lifetime Membership ICR, and Madam has presented papers and publication in national journals and is a faculty speaker in RECOG 2022. Dr. Shashibala has received award, Best IVF Consultant Award in Bihar Medical Summit 2022 and has been awarded a Zainik Jagran Health Excellence Award 2023 by Honorable Governor of Bihar, Sri Rajendra Harlekar. Welcome, Madam Masaget, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this nice introduction. It was such a you know wonderful, detailed introduction. So without wasting time, I would like to start my topic, which is troubleshooting in PCOS. So PCOS that is polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a complex disease. And 50 to 70% of these people, this, uh, you know, these women have hirsutism. And only 50% women with PCOS are actually diagnosed. 5 to 10% women of reproductive age have PCOS. 30 to 75% are obese or overweight. And 50 to 70 percent have insulin resistance, especially when it is associated with obesity. And this complex syndrome has become so common that every one in five women in India as of now suffers from PCOS. So coming to the you know definition and all of this uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, one of the most prevalent endocrine system conditions affecting women of reproductive age that is uh, known as hyperandrogenic anovulation or stain levental syndrome that is polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovarian disease. So conditions where at least one ovary has an ovarian volume greater than 10 ml and at least one ovary has an estimated more than 12 small cysts with diameter ranging from 2 to 9 millimeter. And it is usually diagnosed when complications develop that significantly reduce a patient's quality of life, that is either hair loss, alopecia, acne, or especially infertility-related problems, which actually starts with menstrual irregularity. Coming to the steen Leventhal disease, it's a classic syndrome originally described by Steen and Leventhal. Madam, Le excuse me, madam. Madam, we cannot see your slides, madam. Please share the slides. Sorry? We are unable to see the slides, the uh, presentation. Okay, but I have already shared. I mean, the sharing of screen. You may have to share the screen. Okay, one second. One second, I have already shared. I'm again sharing. That yeah, time yeah. it was visible, no? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Is it okay now? Yes, now it is okay. Now you can put it in the slide show. You can see. It is already. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. It's okay now. So should I repeat from beginning or it's fine if I'll continue it's from okay. here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can continue from here. So, uh, Steen Leventhal disease, that is PCOD, is a classic syndrome originally described by these two scientists, Steen and Leventhal, in 1935, and it includes hyperandrogenism. menstrual irregularities and polycystic ovaries actually when i come to this now i am not able to you know you know change the slide i don't know why it is click on enter ma'am okay so coming to the symptoms of pcos uh, we will discuss one by one the subheadings are you know uh, first one is reproductive uh, problems like it starts with irregular menstrual cycles it includes hirsutism infertility and pregnancy complications coming to the metabolic features which includes insulin resistance diabetes mellitus especially diabetes type 2 and serious complications this insulin resistance is actually the main culprit behind this whole pathophysiology of pcos and the psychological uh, symptoms include anxiety depression mood swings reduced quality of life and poor self esteem so coming to the pathophysiology of pcos according to barrow et al the four key contributors to pathophysiology physiological alterations in pcos are high consumption of carbohydrates hyperinsulinemia hyperandrogenemia and persistent low grade inflammation and the different uh culprits are like environmental toxins genetic predisposition gut dysbiosis diet and lifestyle uh, problems and they all lead to hormonal imbalance which includes altered lh fsh ratio and decreased level of fsh secretion hyperandrogenism hyperandrogenism include increased testosterone and decreased sex hormone binding globulin and the third one is insulin resistance which is actually very important for its pathophysiology and it leads to increased insulin levels and decreased glucose tolerance and these all are actually responsible for causing this pcos and clinical features are hirsutism acne reproductive features include oligo or an ovulation irregular menstrual cycles and subfertility metabolic features are increased risk of metabolic disorders particularly type 2 diabetes and other serious uh, complications uh, like uh, including you know hypothyroidism hyperprolactinemia etc so coming to the diagnostic criteria of pcos in 1990 first you know criteria was given by national institute of uh, child health and human uh, development which included only two criteria that is clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism and chronic anovulation but later on after many years in in 2003 in rotterdam netherland there was a you know conference uh, of uh, you know esri um, and asrm which collectively uh, led to the conclusion that the diagnostic criteria of pcos should include at least one of the three findings which include like clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism oligoanovulation and polycystic ovarian morphology and very recently this androgen excess and uh, pcos criteria i think in 2006 they have again emphasized on hyperandrogenism according to this criteria hyperandrogenism is must Uh, for diagnosis of pcos along with any one of these two uh, findings like oligoanovulation or polycystic ovarian morphology so uh, coming to clinical hyperandrogenism clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism includes hirsutism acne androgenic alopecia that is male pattern baldness all of which relate to the effects of androgens on the pilocybase unit 
hirsutism is the growth of terminal thick coarse hairs on the face or body in a male pattern hirsutism is the most obvious clinical indicator of androgen excess and is an important feature of pcos coming to the acne the prevalence of acne is approximately 12 to 14% among white women with pcos and it is much more common in our women which that is approximately even 25% and uh, androgenic alopecia it is like scalp hair loss in women especially in the uh, male pattern and uh, it also results from hyperandrogenism and is recognized but uncommon feature of pcos and less than 5% of women with pcos complain of hair loss typically the hair loss is limited to the crown and does not involve the frontal hairline coming to ovulatory and menstrual dysfunction the normal intermenstrual interval ranges between 21 to 35 days and menses that occur less or more often are indication of ovulatory dysfunction and in pcos particularly we get cycles which are generally more than 35 days oligo oligomenorrhea is there the majority of women with pcos approximately 60 to 85% exhibit cross menstrual dysfunction and the most common abnormalities are oligomenorrhea and amenorrhea coming to the polycystic ovaries pcos takes its name from the enlarged polycystic ovaries so commonly observed in women with hyperandrogenic chronic anovulation polycystic ovaries typically exhibit increased size and stromal volume and an increased number of small follicles the rotterdam criteria consider only the total number of follicles requiring 12 or more measuring approximately 2 to 9 mm in diameter in either one or even it can be like mean of the both ovaries here i would like to emphasize that in recently i think in 2018 the androgen excess and pco society has revised this number of follicle criteria they have made it now to 25 considering the high resolution and availability of transvaginal vaginal sonography so now the number of follicles are has to be 25 for diagnosis of pcos uh, coming to polycystic ovaries the prevalence of polycystic ovaries is quite high among women with androgen excess that is more than 80% however from 8 percent to 25 percent of normal women and even 14 percent of women using oral contraceptive pills also meet the ultrasonographic criteria for polycystic ovaries so we should always take history before diagnosing anyone labeling anyone as pcos moreover polycystic ovaries are commonly observed during normal pubertal development and even in women with hypothalamic amenorrhea and hyperprolactinemia So the 2003 Rotterdam diagnostic criteria expanded the population of women that might be assigned a diagnosis of PCOS by approximately 50% compared to the criteria earlier recommended by NICHT due to uh, entirely the inclusion of polycystic ovaries uh coming to abnormal gonadotropin secretion increased serum lh concentration and low fsh or normal fsh levels and increased lh fsh ratios are typical but more so in lean than in obese women with pcos in the past an increased lh fsh ratio that is more than 2 is to 1 has been regarded as a marker of pcos but the ratio varies with the says used to measure gonadotropin concentration so consequently gonadotropin levels or ratios are not a reliable diagnostic criteria they neither make nor exclude the diagnosis here i would like to add that we are uh now a days we are rely, relying more on amh levels when it is more than 5 nanogram we label them as polycystic ovaries or polycystic ovarian syndrome insulin resistance it is the main you know culprit behind the pcos pathophysiology and it has to it is the main uh, cause why pcos happens the overall prevalence of insulin resistance among women with pcos is between 50% and 75% and greater in obese than in lean women with pcos 
most women with PCOS and insulin resistance are young <clears throat> and have ample pancreatic beta cell reserve. Consequently, they are able to generate a compensatory hyperinsulinemia, allowing them to maintain normal glucose homeostasis, at least in the fasting state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another metabolic abnormality is dyslipidemia, which is most common metabolic abnormality observed in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia are associated with decreased high-density lipoprotein, cholesterol, and elevated triglyceride levels, and nearly 70% have at least one borderline or elevated lipid levels. Some also have observed elevated low-density lipoprotein, concentrations. So how should we evaluate a woman in whom for whom we are suspecting that OKC might be having PCOD? We should proceed with serum TSH, serum prolactin to our OGT, fasting lipid profile. Endometrial sampling like it, it is it should be done only when it is indicated like when there is history of you know heavy bleeding and on TBS we are having high or uh, endometrial thickness more than 12 millimeter serum testosterone in women with moderate or severe hirsutism. <clears throat> Morning follicular feed serum 17 hydroxyprogesterone in women with pre or perimenopausal pre or uh, peri uh, menarchial onset of hirsutism that is late onset of hirsutism or if she is having a family history of congenital adrenal hyperplasia or high risk ethnicity. To rule out Cushing syndrome, we should do 24-hour uh, urinary free serum uh, cortisol level or if indicated, overnight dexamethasone suppression test should be done to rule out hypercortisolism. Coming to the infertility, which is actually very uh, close to me and uh, because I'm dealing with these cases, so I can correlate with these uh, patients. Infertility affects 40% women with PCOS. PCOS is most common cause of anovulatory infertility and approximately 90 to 95% of anovulatory women presenting to infertility clinic have PCOS. In addition, spontaneous abortions occurs more frequently in PCOS with uh, incidence ranging from 42 to 73%. This is so important and so significant and I, I will try to explain here that in our experience, even if we are taking these patients for IVF, their failure rate is more, their, uh, in spite of having more number of uh, follicles, oocyte quality is compromised, number of blastocysts, you know, the ratio of blastocyst conversion is poor, implantation rate is poor, and they even they abort more. So this is all we should we actually take into consideration while uh, counseling a patient of PCOS who has come for uh, IVF. And it's an inherent ovarian disorder. It's a polygenic disorder. Studies show reduced rate of conception despite therapy with clomiphene. And uh, <clears throat> here I would like to emphasize that in PCOS patient, now we don't use clomiphene. We use letrozole, which is first-line treatment for uh, this PCOS patients. If uh, we are uh, uh, taking them for stimulation. So investigations include serum testosterone level, DHEA uh, levels, 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels, TSH, prolactin, FSH, LH, estrogen levels, sex hormone, binding globulin levels, lipid profiles, AMH levels, TSH, and 2 hours GTT. In my opinion, just for a if there is no uh, serious uh, implications, uh, like uh, there is no clinical feature of high, very high test, you know, hyperandrogenemia, then we can just uh, go with this uh, TSH, prolactin, AMH, lipid profile, uh, uh, TVS, and two-hour OGT. The rest of the things we should take into consider consideration if we are suspecting, like we have to rule out uh, with Cushing's or our late, you know, late onset hirsutism or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Coming to the goal of treatment, our goal is to give them regular menstrual cycle, improve their insulin sensitivity, reduction of weight, improved fertility and rate of conception, and decreased androgen levels. 
So PCOS is a condition that spans the lives of women. Fetal programming may represent the beginning of a syndrome characterized by hyperandrogenic anovulation and insulin resistance, which can have a series of medical consequences in adolescence, adulthood, and old age. Menstrual and fertility problems evolve into metabolic compli uh, complications as age advances. With early diagnosis being crucial if the aforementioned sometimes fatal complications are to be avoided. A precise diagnosis is important, especially at the extreme ends of the reproductive lifespan. Lifestyle therapy tends to be the first step in the PCOS management, especially when excess body weight is associated. Pharmacotherapy is frequently used to manage the most predominant manifestations in each age group, such as irregular menses, hirsutism in adolescents, fertility problems in adulthood, and metabolic problems and risk of cancer in old age. So starting with lifestyle, improving outcomes, healthy lifestyle, healthy eating and regular physical activity for excess weight gain prevention is important for all women with PCOS regardless of weight. See, healthy lifestyle is something which is helpful for improving overall well-being of any person. And obviously in PCOS, it is going to be more helpful. And excess weight is you know, problematic for everyone, for every, you know, in every stage of life, for everyone. So, in PCOS particularly, our aim is to reduce at least 5 to 10 percent of weight loss, which has a significant positive effect on clinical outcomes when over the six months. And diet in PCOS, uh, you know, uh, there's no specific diet, but we have to take into consider consideration the, uh, you know, that we have to give them comparatively low carbohydrate content containing diets high protein diet and there has to be general energy deficits of approximately 30 percent just to have a bet better control of weight exercise prevention or weight gain it includes moderate in intensity like more than 150 minutes per week or 75 minutes per week exercise that is weight loss for weight loss uh, moderate in intensity exercise has to be done like more than uh, 250 minutes per week or 150 minutes per week. Whatever is comfortable for that particular person, it is advisable to go for these exercises. And behavioral strategies include goal setting, self-monitoring and slower eating, etc. See, it is not easy for PCOS patient to reduce the weight. It's like a tapasya for them. So they need a lot of counseling and uh, motivation to do that because most of them will complain that they are not eating much and because of their metabolic abnormalities, they are actually having weight gain. So only these things are supportive, but we have to work on the main uh, pathophysiology and main, main culprit also. I'll talk about it later on. Yes, that is pharmacotherapy of PCOS. Low androgen oral contraceptive pills that contain drosperinone or progestin-only pills known as mini pills. They, this type of pills uh, we used to give previously and uh, now the you know scenario has changed. Now we have started because after so many of years now in a, we are in a position to understand both the you know determinants and sequelae of this. PCOS. So now we are actually, as a, as a clinician, we are focusing on the main pathophysiology of the uh, this uh, complex syndrome. An inositol supplement, that is myoinositol, d chiroinositol, or a combination of the two in a very partic that particular ratio, that is 40 to 1, is very helpful and uh, it can help manage PCOS symptoms to a much, uh, you know, you know, to a greater extent such as hirsutism, acne, difficulty in conceiving, these all are can be these all can be taken care of. And the uh, other is metformin. If this lipidemia is there, we have to take help of lipid lowering agents. And uh, so where is the gap? The more main, more main is lean PCOS because in this, only correction of PCOS is needed. Infertility PCOS, correction of PCOS and ovulation has to be taken care. 
an obese patient, we have to take care of their weight also along with PCOS. And if there is insulin resistance, we have to take care of that insulin uh, resistance and we should work on how to improve insulin sensitivity in these PCOS patients. And where there is hormonal imbalance, we have to correct that entire uh, imbalance inside the body of the patient. But unfortunately, as of now, we don't have any, uh, we were not, actually, we were not having any uh, formulation which are uh, giving complete therapy. So, just to, uh, you know, uh, solve this problem, the active ingredients needed are myoinositol, dichyroinositol in a ratio that is 40 is to 1. They will regularize menses improves egg quality and they restores natural ovulation. Other is chromium picolinate. It's a trace element needed in very less amount, but it improves insulin sensi sensitivity equally as per, uh, you know, as per the metformin. And mel other is melot melatonin. It improves oocyte quality. Vitamin D3, it Im imp improves ovulation and folic acid, it improves oocyte quality. So these all are actually needed in any formulation to address all those gaps which are being there uh, while treating the PCOS patients. So coming to the myoinositol and the thyroinositol. In PCOS, studies shows a 500-fold decrease in the myoinositol levels of the ovaries of uh, you know, PCOS patients. Follicular development is impaired owing to the reduced myoinositol levels in the ovaries. And combined dose of myoinositol and dichyroinositol is administered, which is found to be extremely beneficial in treatment of PCOS. Myoinositol has a substantial role in ovulation, while dichyroinositol has role in insulin resistance. So they improve in insulin sensitivity and their combination is a wonderful treatment for PCOS patients. So there is a medical rationale why we give this combination for treating PCOS patients. And the recommended dose of myoinositol is 2000 mg BID. And it's a study uh, which has been done for the management of women with PCOS using myoinositol and folic acid. And it has shown that it has improved, you know, uh, ins insulin sensitivity. It has improved, improved very much. And there is uh, no more rate of severe side effects were observed when myoinositol were used at the doses of 4000 mg per day. See, with metformin, the main problem is it's, it is not actually tolerated in the required dose which is needed for PCOS patients. So the main benefit with chrome, this um, uh, ionositol uh, is that it even in a higher dose, it is relatively it is, uh, tolerable. Benefits of 40 is to 1 ratio of myoinositol and dichyroinositol. There are two stereoisomers of inositol and they both are wonderful insulin sensitizers. In the human ovary, myoinositol is a second messenger of FSH and myoinositol mediates FSH signaling. The dichyroinositol is an aromatase inhibitor. So their ratio into, you know, 40 is to 1 ratio, they allow a treatment for polycystic ovarian syndrome in a wonderful way. Myoinositol and dichyroinositol ratio were able to improve the regularity of the menstrual cycle, acne score, the endocrine and metabolic parameters and the insulin resistance. The entire spectrum were much actually being taken care with this wonderful combination. Now coming to the trace element, chromium picolinate. Chromium is combined with picolinate in order to decrease gut absorption. When given in PCOS, it reduces hyperinsulinemia and hyperandrogenism. It acts by enhancing insulin signaling. It improves insulin sensitivity and facilitates fat loss. It is better tolerated than metformin. The combined action of both inositol and chromium picolinate on insulin regulation will help treat the underlying cause in PCOS. There is a study 
comparing metformin and chromium picolinate in clomiphen citrate resistant patients with PCO. It's a double blind randomized clinical trial and the results have shown that chromium picolinate was better tolerated compared to metformin. Uh, nonetheless, the two study groups were not significantly different regarding ovulation and pregnancy rates means it is giving equally good results with better tolerability. And uh, this is another study where uh, uh, metformin and chromium picolinate has been uh, studied. And the conclusion is that chromium picolinate was better tolerated than metformin due to lower side effects. Nevertheless, no significant differences were observed between the two groups regarding ovulation and pregnancy rates. Therefore, metformin could be replaced by chromium in some PCOS patients. Coming to the next miracle molecule, that is melatonin. Melatonin is something really very new but being used in, being helpful in many uh, different conditions like PCOS. We are also using it as a you know, uh, stress relieving uh, element. It is also being used for poor wear and reserve, for poor oocyte quality. So <clears throat> how melatonin helps in PCOS patients? Concentration of melatonin in pre-ovulatory follicular fluid is lower in women with PCOS. Melatonin supports nuclear maturation of oocytes in vitro and melatonin administration may be useful in vitro fertilization strategies and improve clinical outcomes of PCOS. Therefore, melatonin may provide improvement of oocyte quality and obviously they will lead to increased pregnancy rates. Melatonin is a sleep-inducing hormone. It lowers stress level and in present scenario, stress in itself is a big problem for every, many of the disease, I would say. So it's like, it is actually going to help not only in PCOS, it is also being used for poor ovarian reserve, poor oocyte quality, and it is actually helpful. The role of melatonin in polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a review and it had shown that <clears throat> it was found that administration of melatonin can improve the oocyte and embryo quality in PCOS patients. It may also have beneficial effects in correcting the hormone alterations in PCOS patients. So, uh, since metabolic dysfunction is the major finding contributing to the initiation of PCOS, Melatonin can hinder the process via its improving effects on metabolic functions. Melatonin effective to reduce the microscopic symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome related infertility. It's an experimental study and it had shown that melatonin administration increased the expression levels of MT1 receptor and GDF9 and BMP15 in PCOS protein and mRNA levels, it was determined that melatonin added administration reduced the microscopic symptoms of PCOS. Melatonin was found to be effective via MT1 receptor in the pathogenesis of PCOS and it suppressed the transport pathway of GD59 to granulosa cells in antral follicles. It's another study. <clears throat> and uh, melatonin in the clinical management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. PCOS is one of the most prevalent endocrine disorder affecting women of reproductive age. PCOS is characterized by oligoovulation and or anovulation and excess androgens. Recently, the penile hormone, that is melatonin, earned serious attention for clinical use in the management of PCOS with infertility. Melatonin treatment led to improvement of ovarian functions, oocyte quality, metabolic, and hormonal profiles in PCOS. Accumulating studies provide persuasive <clears throat> evidence in favor of the conjecture that melatonin, due to its broad spectrum antioxidant property, may play a critical role in the care and cure of this syndrome. Coming to folic acid and vitamin D3, these are very basic. And, you know, <clears throat> micronutrients, they, this folic acid help manage infertility rooted in ovulation problems for both 
women with and without PCOS, whoever is planning for conception, we usually give folic acid. Vitamin D3 may play a key role in helping some women seeking treatment for PCOS syndrome related infertility, get pregnancy. Vitamin D3, you know, this is deficiency is so common in our society. So even if in a normal patient will give vitamin D3, it will help. And in PCOS patient particularly, we should supplement them with sub, you know proper level of proper doses of vitamin D3. So coming to the case study, see, uh, excuse me, hello, hello, yes, madam. So I have come to uh, the case study. So will you? Uh, do you no, know, you know, you know, uh, do a clinical experience about the combination, if you can share. I I I have used myelotin in doses of one tablet BID. I think in last uh, more than one month, one year, I'm using this molecule. In a, in a specific, uh, you know, patient that you'd like to describe? Yes, case yes, for yes. In PCOS oh. patient, some, uh, whoever is having like, uh, whoever is coming for infertility related issues to me, I'm, descri I'm prescribing them uh, malotin one tablet PD for at least three months. And see, in I have seen that patients, some patients are conceiving naturally, some patients are conceiving with IUI, and some yeah. patient who, who is having bad quality of oocyte or who is having history of failed IVF, uh, even with us or outside our center, after giving three months of this myelotin, when we have given them the chances of conception and the more important thing, chances, you know, rate of abortion is also less. Okay. So I personally is very happy with this Milo. I mean this Milotin tablet. One one uh, important concern is its safety. Although uh, you, I mean manufacturer, uh, they uh, they are they say it's safe, but I till uh -huh. now I'm stopping the moment they become beta CG positive. Okay. If they are not frank diabetic. So They're on correct. this I will. Ask your opinion though whether I I should continue them in pregnancy like metformin or what? Madam, clinically, what you find the best, you know, you have to follow that finally because there will be very many studies on this clinically judgment. Okay. I can't hear you clearly, sir. Your voice is cracking. I think there is. Is it okay now? No, it's it's echoing. One minute. Uh, I just see. Clear right now. It is not clear, sir. Hello. Ah, uh, it is better. Uh, Sandhya, clear. Can you hear me? It is better now. You can proceed. Questions on this, you know. I'll just share them with you. Uh, okay, okay. Them is, Parker, your voice is cracking. It's echoing. I don't know why it's echoing. I think you should stop something. I mean, is it okay now? Ha, uh, this is better. This is better, Doctor okay. Doctor Shashiwala. Can you just increase the volume of your voice as well? Okay. If you could speak a little bit louder, yeah. My voice is better now. Yeah, madam. Why you are saying this at the end? Yes. I mean, I would have increased in the beginning only, now. <laughs> is this okay, madam? Can you hear? Yes, yes, it's quite better. Yeah. Uh, is there any specific type of PCS where you prefer these type of combinations? Some questions which yes, are... Yes, 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 yes. See, when uh, I hmm. see that patient is having central obesity, very severe, okay. uh, like more than 10, and uh, on TBS also I'm getting a lot of, you know, typical that necklace pattern of, you know, oh. like my ultrasound findings are suggestive of it's a chronic, chronic PCOD. And uh, her BMI is high, especially her central obesity is there, signs of insulin resistance like, you know, uh, 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 acanthosis, nigricans is there, uh, her, you know, uh, acne is there. Then I think this Correct. lady definitely improved. They will, she will benefit with uh, this uh, myelotin. Okay. 
Wonderful. And madam, uh, you know, in different type of PCOS that are with predominantly reproductive system or metabolic syndrome, which type of PCOS would this combination be useful? Which type uh, of symptoms it, rather this it, combination it, would see, respond better? Uh, it will help. This myelotin is helpful in actually decreasing the insulin resistance and the hyperandrogenemia. So basically, it will okay. improve the overall not only one symptom, oh, okay. the overall spectrum of the patient. Like it Understand. Will, yeah. Yes. Everything can be taken care. Only only what my so my concern is it's safety in pregnancy, sir. That you should No, no, because there will be no big study, we would certainly not say. Yeah. So there are no studies. Will, so yeah. Usually I'm like uh, very correct. I, I usually stop after with SCGs. Very, so very actually. correct, very correct. Because, because you know, all sudden then there are no there would not what be any studies in pregnancy. What happens with metformin if she is obese with impaired or you know, impaired OGT? In that those cases we continue even throughout pregnancy with metformin okay, uh -huh. or other combinations. But but with this myelotin, I till now I'm stopping after beta SCG positive. Correct, correct, madam. Because we wouldn't suggest, you know, because there will be no studies there and it will be a big risk to do that. Yes. No, it should not be used during pregnancy. You know, a lot is spoken about this ratio of myoinositol and d chiroinositol, 40 is to 1. What is your practical experience? You know, because... Uh, it is actually the appropriate ratio. It is the actual appropriate ratio which is needed for, you know, best effect. And you, know, you of course, answered this question, you know, like how long would you prescribe? Generally for three months minimum, you said. Yes, at least three to six months. Three to six months. Even see, in, <laughs> in, in PCOS patients, we are going for almost 100% frozen embryos transfer. So Absolutely. what I, I prefer after, generally after, in normal patients, we give a gap of approximately 40, 45 days. But in these patients, we use, uh, for, exp for you know, I used to explain them, then go reduce weight and I give them a gap of approximately two to three months. So approximately mm -hmm. two, three months before, uh, you know, ovum pickup and after that two, three months after pickup. And in those cases, I have, I think in last month, I have three patients which has become, they have become positive in first attempt. Oh, Previously, wow. I, I used to be very, you know, scary when their results are supposed to come because <laughs> they fail more, they abort more. There is like yeah. problems are very much Actually, it becomes very difficult to counsel because patient will learn, how many fail, so it yeah. becomes actually very difficult. They will not understand. Uh, but with but in you side, you have only one or two blasts. Absolutely, or yeah. you have negative result or yeah. you abort. But, it, but yeah, but uh, as you rightly said, you know, once the patients are pregnant, we have to be careful. There yes. will be no studies. We should yes. not prescribe. We should not prescribe. This is any any adverse effect uh, you have seen when the patient is on this? Not very much. See, the, previously my patients are very much irritated with this metformin. Yeah, Although yeah. Although it, it, its safety profile is there, but it is not actually being tolerated very easily in the appropriate dose actually. Correct, so correct. we are correct. generally prescribing just 500 milligrams just to lower the, you know, side effects that, okay, something is better mm. than nothing. Yeah. So yeah. That's prob that problem is not there with this myelotin. It is well tolerated. Correct, correct. And this also question you answer, how soon the patient responds? They can respond as fast as within one month. Maybe you said. I After think that is all, madam. The embryo transfer, we stop yeah. it. So generally, non, uh, I'm not talking about specific pregnancy. I'm talking about IVF. I'm talking in general. See, uh, my 99% patients are IVF pregnant. Okay. So I would be a better person to talk okay. about this IVF yeah, scenario. Okay, okay. Anyway, thank you for this wonderful insights, madam. It was a lovely uh, presentation. And I'm sure everyone benefited. Opportunity. Yes. And actually, I thank I all the doctors. Yeah. Yeah, madam, you're actually, saying something? Actually, I was, uh, see, I was in a search. I, I mean, myself was in a search of uh, some substitute for this uh, little bit toxic drug. Like metformin is not very easy to tolerate, especially and patient ha has a very bad impression. Sometimes they will become angry. They're talking, okay, I diabetes wala drug. De diya. They will come <laughs> outside. So, this thing is a little bit of a problem for us. Only safety profile is there. You just have some data after some time. If there, everything is okay, you if you will get get uh, you know approval from the drug authority. In the after that, it'll, it will be a wonderful drug and very um, very well accepted by everyone. I will 
I will assure you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. But until there are studies, we would not, uh, you know, like to take any risk. Yeah, that's that we have to take. And I thank all the doctors who took part from their, uh, who took time from their uh, busy schedule and uh, commitments and attended the webinar. Thank you, marketing team, Hitro Healthcare, for conceptualizing and organizing this webinar. As you all will agree with me, this type of uh, I mean, session is successful only with the coordination from the field. I thank you, Hitro Field personnel, for super coordination. Last but not the least, I thank IT team Hydro for your support and guidance in all IT related matters. Thank you once again. Thank you all of you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for this opportunity thank you, madam. so that thank I can you. put my insights and my experiences. Thank you so much, Priyaji and everyone. Dr. Prashant, thank you so much. Can I leave?